Well, folks, and welcome back. Uh, this lecture will cover Chapter 10, uh, Persuasive Messages. Now, this is really one of my favorite topics. It's one of the most classical topics from a uh, rhetorical uh, perspective, rhetorical education. We, uh, you know, Back in the day, students would spend years on this topic. Uh, but we'll see. It's very useful for a variety of business situations and also life in general, I think. And to set the stage for this one, I found another clip from the office, uh, this time with our uh, friend Dwight Schrute. Being taught how to uh, pitch or make a sales pitch to a uh, female audience, I think you'll see he really, he's really uh, gonna, going to uh, bungle this incredibly. Uh, but as you watch the clip, think about, you know, what is it that he's gotten so wrong? Sort of where is his biggest mistakes? Uh, is he doing anything right? <laughs> Basically, uh, just what can we glean from uh, this example, uh, if you will, of a uh, of a sales pitch to women? Uh, so watch the clip, come back, uh, let me know what you think, and then we'll continue on. And here we go with the learning objectives. We'll talk about the relationship between credibility and persuasion, or as I like to say, ethos and persuasion. Uh, basically your character, uh, your reputation, or the reputation of your company. And we'll talk about that aim, planning process, audience, information, and message. Uh, that process for persuasive messages, how do we adapt it from routine to persuasive, basically. Uh, the basic components of the persuasive message. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of tone and style of persuasive uh, of, uh, persuasive, messages, <laughs> persuasive messages, and how those impact your influence. Uh, so it's not that you'll always have the same style and tone across the different kinds of business documents. Sometimes it'll affect a very personal or friendly tone or humorous sometimes. It just depends on the situation. Uh, so we'll get into that. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, four more here. We'll talk about compelling internal persuasive messages. In other words, messages to uh, coworkers and colleagues, like the uh, Dwight Schrute example. Uh, and then also the uh, external persuasive messages, in other words, going out to clients, customers. <laughs> that's, that's what the, uh, uh, the office uh, staff were trying to uh, train Dwight how to do, right? Go talk to somebody, uh, a group outside the company. Uh, and then let's see what else. So construct effective mass sales messages. You know, we won't spend a lot of time on that. You know, you can take whole, whole courses dedicated to this. <laughs> We're in mass comm, uh, but we'll touch on it. I always think it's an interesting topic. Uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up by evaluating persuasive messages for effectiveness. And also, probably uh, uh, most critically, from in my opinion, is, is fairness. You know, it's one thing to, can you be persuasive, but is it, is that the right thing to do? <laughs> are you uh, misleading your audience? Are you being dishonest somehow? And even if you achieve your immediate goal with that, uh, sometimes it comes back to, to bite you. And here's the uh, layout of the chapter. As you can see, we'll start with the credibility, persuasion, go on to those components, tone and style, internal and external, the mass messages, and then uh, wrap up with effective and fair persuasive messages. So quite a beefy PowerPoint. So they start by talking about this notion of credibility, and they've got some quotes from Let's see, Michael Meslansky. So he's a leading corporate communication expert. And he's, uh, I guess, achieved some, some credibility himself for labeling this era that we're in, calling it the post-trust era, or PTE. And the idea is that I guess we've become so inundated, so cynical, uh, so pessimistic of these uh, big big corporations, big companies, conglomerates. Uh, think about Monsanto, uh, for example, big pharma, <laughs> you know, you name it. Uh, the idea, I guess, is that before people tended to be a little bit more credulous of claims coming from those companies. You know, you kind of assume that, uh, yeah, I guess they're out to make a profit, but you really didn't question everything that they said. Uh, but he, according to uh, Ms. Lansky, we're a lot more likely to do that. Just respond, <laughs> sort of your knee-jerk response is extreme skepticism uh, towards whatever message is being sent to you from any company. Uh, they have a, a lot of examples in this chapter from the uh, credit union, uh, nonprofit credit union, and talking about how even that, uh, when they send out their, their less letters and messages, people tend to be very cynical, <laughs> questioning, questioning everything. And so obviously uh, something like this would have an impact on professional communication. It's, uh, I guess the first thing to think about is just thinking about this post-trust era and how we might need to modify our strategies, maybe adopt more classical rhetorical stuff 
uh, even for seemingly straightforward business communications. Uh, so let's see what we have on, on the slide here. Yeah, so heightened uh, need for persuasive messages. Uh, if the audience members uh, question your credibility, they are unlikely to carefully consider your ideas, requests, or recommendations, uh, certainly. <laughs> you know, that, it's, it's almost common sense, but uh, I think sometimes companies don't think enough about this idea. You know, are they credible? Are they, tr are they trustworthy? Have they done something to uh, betray the public trust? You know, one of the examples that comes to mind instantly, because I was kind of affected by it, was the, uh, uh, the Volkswagen uh, car company. Uh, they had basically cheated on some of their environmental uh, emission standards test. You know, I don't know all the details about it, but uh, <laughs> you know, they got enough trouble where they had to pay a lot of money. Uh, something about their diesel engines not being as eco-friendly as they had led people to believe. Uh, but, you know, once the word of that got out, I'm sure it, it hurt uh, Volkswagen's uh, bottom line quite a bit. And who's really going to take them seriously after that? You know, if they roll out some new eco-friendly vehicle, you know, who's going to uh, even, you know, give that a second glance? <laughs> They've kind of uh, ruined, that, ruined their credibility with that. Okay, let's see. Uh, applying the aim planning process uh, to the persuasive messages. So uh, the hardest part to me, you know, I don't know about you, but I always have to look up like aim <laughs> and fair. <laughs> you know, so these are, I don't know how useful these acronyms are sometimes. Now, uh, this is a little bit shorter. I can usually remember this. Uh, but it, it's very important to think about these components that this acronym stands for. Right, so analyzing the, the audience. And that's really the crucial thing, right? If you don't know, I think probably one of the hardest situations to be in is where you don't know anything about your audience and you're out there trying to uh, persuade them to do something. You know, the, the common example in rhetoric is the used car salesperson. <laughs> so you just got somebody coming on to a lot. Uh, you don't never met this person before, don't know anything about them. Uh, so it's the sign of a good uh, car salesperson to instantly be able to start at least guessing uh, about those, that person's needs, values, and uh, how they will be influenced. And I've read a lot of books on this, <laughs> not the car sales, <laughs> uh, but just in sales and general marketing, I just kind of find that interesting. Uh, some of the strategies they use, uh, just, you know, the way if it's, a, if it's a couple, you know, the way the couple looks at each other, the way the couple looks at each other, uh, they try to figure out who's the real decision maker there. It's uh, not always what you might think, or even like the way they dressed, <laughs> the cars they're looking at. It's a lot of subtle stuff that goes into this, uh, you know, figuring out what they need, but also the the values, right? Kind of talked just a minute ago about the eco-friendly uh, Volkswagen. You know, before that thing, before that scandal, um, the Volkswagen dealer might have, uh, you know, been able to peg somebody as probably being concerned <laughs> about the environment. <laughs> That's something they value. And so they might, they might have used that insight uh, to steer them towards that diesel engine. You know, that's just one quick, quick example. Uh, gathering the right information as you wrestle with the complicated business issues at hand. Uh, yeah, this definitely impacts our credibility as well, I would say. You know, there's nothing worse than being on a car lot or being in a computer store or something like this, or uh, maybe you uh, shopping for a phone and you're dealing with somebody that doesn't really seem to know very much <laughs> about the stuff they're selling. <laughs> you know, they don't have, they don't know the technical information. They don't know if this is compatible with that, uh, how long the battery will last, you know, just sort of basic information you think would be uh, critical. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you know, you, there's no just, you can't learn everything there is to know, I guess is the, is the key there. I still want to tie this back in, I think, to the, the audience. And what is that audience? What's the right information for that audience? If, it, if, if, they're, if they don't care about the environment, uh, then it's not really going to help you very much to be studying all these uh, factoids about uh, emission standards. Uh, and then finally, developing the message, a message that most effectively reduces resistance it gains buy -ins. <laughs> In other words, uh, a persuasive message. Uh, so they start here by talking about understanding your audience. And it, this probably is the most important aspect of rhetoric, I think. It's, it's something that even, you know, uh, people that really fail <laughs> at persuasion, it's usually because they, they don't really understand the audience. Uh, maybe they haven't even considered the audience. You know, I see this all the time in resume writing and 
and uh, job letter applications. You know, somebody will uh, sit down and make a resume and a cover letter, and they'll only be thinking about themselves the whole time. You know, what what makes them special, what they enjoy, even like the hobbies they uh, enjoy, uh, all sorts of things about themselves, but not a word in there, not a thought towards the audience, which is the, of course, the, the company they're, they're applying for and the, and, the, and the human resources, but also the, you know, potential colleagues and, and the, the type of company it is that that company has needs <laughs> and values, <laughs> uh, but they don't really bother to try to connect uh, any of their, uh, uh, basically their pitch to that particular audience, right? They, they don't even know what the, they don't know anything about the company. Uh, they haven't studied it. Uh, they don't know what makes that company different than the company across the street. <laughs> uh, they don't know what the particular needs are. You know, and this really, uh, you know, if you don't get this part right, everything else is kind of garbage at that point. And so you really have to understand the audience. And obviously you can't understand them completely. You know, people are <laughs> people. are people. They're unpredictable. Uh, but you can certainly learn as much as you can. And the more you know, uh, the better you'll be able to uh, skew your pitch. Uh, so let's look at some of these components here. Uh, persuade through shared purpose and shared values. Yes, this is a great one. And by the way, uh, one of the most famous rhetoricians, uh, it's actually a literary theorist named Kenneth Burke. And he was writing back, I guess, in the I don't know if it was the 50s or the 60s, uh, but he basically said the same thing. He said, really, persuasion, it's not really about the content of your message so much as, as it is you're connecting your values with somebody else, right? If you can make somebody feel like you're on their team or, <laughs> you know, you're like them, <laughs> uh, your values are compatible with their values, that will uh, tend to be more important. Uh, you know, put, put it this way, if you feel like you, you don't, uh, then it doesn't really matter what else they do or say, right? If you feel like this person is on the <laughs> opposite, opposite uh, ideologically speaking from you, or they're, uh, you know, they, they seem to be, uh, you seem to have a common purpose, like uh, you're trying to get the best car, <laughs> best budget, <laughs> best value uh, for your money. Uh, but maybe you start to suspect, well, the salesperson, really, this, this person just wants to make as high of a commission as possible, right, and, and sell you a bunch of uh, worthless uh, add-ons and, and things. So if, if that's what comes across, well, obviously, you probably want to go on to the next <laughs> car lot. <laughs> uh, whereas if you are convinced they have that you share purpose and values, that will uh, probably get the sale. Well, let's see what else we have here. Show people they are sincerely needed and appreciated. You know, another uh, good tip people tend to over overlook, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of stereotype that you hear every time you walk into a company, right? <laughs> we appreciate our customers. <laughs> we value uh, your patronage or however they word that. Often comes across as insincere. Uh, you know, at least they're making an effort, though. Uh, I was reading in the news that Walmart has, uh, they've been sort of laying off, discontinuing their, their greeter greeter program. So before you could walk into the store, there'd be somebody there and, you know, hello, welcome to Walmart, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Uh, and now they're phasing that out. So I guess they've decided that they <laughs> that wasn't working. <laughs> it didn't make people feel uh, like they were sincere about the, the business. You know, kind of humorously, some I like, I like to joke uh, when I walk into one of those uh, Walmarts with a greeter. Sometimes the greeter doesn't look up, <laughs> doesn't seem to notice me. <laughs> And I always feel like, well, you know, I guess Walmart doesn't need or appreciate me today. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, but that was an example of a, a company trying to show this. Uh, let's see, understand the methods of influence. So this is the really the key from a rhetorical perspective, right? How, what are the different, you know, what is it, Aristotle? What are the available means of persuasion? Uh, and then we'll talk about persuasion through emotion and reason. And most people in a business mindset, they think it's all about reason, right? If you just get the information, give them the right data, uh, that will do the trick. Uh, when what we found time and time again, and if you, if you have any common sense at all, you know, it's really emotion plays a huge role as well. Uh, so a lot of times we'll make a decision, even if uh, the information is shows that we should go the other way, uh, we're more moved by uh, emotion. So let's look at some, some of these methods of influence, the means of persuasion. And some of this is coming to us uh, by way of anthropology. anthropology. 
you know, there were people like uh, Melanowski, a famous anthropologist that went and uh, I think he got caught. <laughs> he went to do some anthropological work uh, with a, I forget exactly where he was, either South, I think either South America or Africa. But anyways, during uh, one of these world wars, uh, so he, he only meant to be there for a few weeks and ended up <laughs> having to stay there for years <laughs> until they could find, uh, I guess, rescue him or get him out of there. Uh, but anyway, it gave him lots and lots of time to really study these uh, different kinds of societies. And, you know, it's interesting when you study people that are very different than you. You, know, you can learn a lot about uh, your own society, and that's what they've done here. And so some of these ideas are coming from that, like this uh, idea of gift-giving economies and salespeople basically have applied some of the same techniques. Very interesting. Uh, so let's see, what do they talk about here? Dr. Robert Caldini, a marketing psychologist. Uh, so he was one of the ones applying this, uh, these lessons from uh, Malinowski. Uh, six principles of persuasion we'll talk about. Reciprocation, consistency, social proof, <laughs> liking, authority, and scarcity. So here's how he defines uh, reciprocation. Uh, we should try to repay in kind what another person has provided us. So we should try to repay in kind what another person has uh, provided us. And we see all kinds of examples of this uh, from anthropology. Uh, you know, there's societies where they <laughs> basically, you know, pass the same gifts around, sort of re-gifting you know, all the time. Uh, there's also this idea that the, if you really want to command respect and be the you know, be a powerful chief, let's say. Really, a lot of that depends on how great of gifts can you give to your followers. And you know, you even see the same thing. I was uh, listening to a lecture series about King Arthur's court, <laughs> and that was the same idea there, right? That to be the king, uh, we you know you tend to think, well, the king tells everybody what to do, uh, but really, it's the king's able to give uh, great gifts to everybody. You know, swords, beautiful sets of armor, uh, grants of land, all this stuff. And, you know, the idea is, hey, I've given you this tract of land, now you owe me something. It's all about <laughs> being, being owed. Uh, it's kind of funny, too, when you give somebody a... They talked about Christmas cards. And this was bizarre to me. Uh, but they said that there was a study where they just sent out uh, uh, Christmas cards to people, uh, basically at random people that the uh, sender didn't even know. So these people just got this Christmas card out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, I guess that they knew that it was a person that worked at their company or something. Uh, but anyway, the interesting thing was that I think it was more than half of them reciprocated. Right, so they got this card, and then they, they went out and bought their own card and sent it back to this uh, person who they didn't even know. Uh, simply based on this concept of, uh, <laughs> I guess they felt like <laughs> they, they owed it. And you see some other examples, uh, uh, some of the more famous ones. There's a lot of charities that will send out... Uh, mailing labels uh, so they'll have your address on the like a sticker and you'll just get a sheet of these you didn't ask for it <laughs> it's unsolicited just comes to your mailbox and you get that and then you feel like well uh, you know these are nice labels uh, maybe I should donate some money <laughs> to the charity <laughs> uh, so that and also another example I, I think is interesting is the idea of a free sample so when you go to the mall uh, there'll be if you go to the food court, uh, sometimes there'll be a, uh, you know, somebody out there with a tray, basically, with little toothpicks uh, through a piece of meat or <laughs> uh, what is it? They, uh, like sesame chicken is the one that uh, I, I saw last time. So they'll be out there with these little little uh, free samples, little chocolates, you know, whatever it is. And they find that about a quarter of people that try the sample or that accept the sample end up buying the uh, product. So that's a pretty high return on an investment just for a little bitty sample, right? And you might go and buy a whole box uh, or, or eat a meal there, all right? So it pays off. Now, that's just a reciprocation, and you can try it for fun sometimes if you uh, just <laughs> just randomly sort of give somebody a gift or something and see how that, uh, you know, see what kind of impact that has. All right, let's, uh, <laughs> maybe that's why, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, uh, maybe this is why uh, parents give kids gifts for their birthdays and stuff, right? Sort of <laughs> sociologically speaking. <laughs> maybe it's, the, it's in the hope that they will return the favor uh, by being good uh, and not misbehaving. Okay, uh, and then the consistency principle. Uh, this one's kind of uh, a little weird too. Uh, so this is the idea. Once people make an explicit commitment, they tend to follow through or honor uh, on that uh, commitment. Uh, so let's see, do they give us 
another example here in other words they want to <laughs> stay consistent with their original commitment uh, I'm not I think the example I'm trying to remember the one from the book if you uh, if you get I think they gave you a t-shirt about this walkathon <laughs> or if you tell somebody <laughs> okay here's the example uh, finally <laughs> and so there's all these uh, in, in politics when they're trying to get people to get out the vote and things they will uh, sometimes call you and just ask you over the phone before the actual voting takes place and they'll just ask you do, do you plan to vote and you'll say yes and I'll, you know will you vote for me <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, so that they say once people make that explicit commitment uh, they're a lot more likely to go ahead and vote uh, than people that weren't called and, and weren't asked about it if that makes any sense so if you ever wonder why you get those sorts of uh, calls <laughs> that's what it's about is this uh, principle of consistency uh, then we have a uh, social proof and liking uh, the social proof is a well let's just read what they have your principle of influence whereby people determine what is right correct or desirable uh, by seeing what others do <laughs> so you know what company has really capitalized on that is uh, Amazon you know big time if you go to any of the books uh, it'll show you reviews there and you can see the I guess really the whole idea of a bestseller list is about social proof right you say what you know what book should I read uh, I'm about to catch a flight I'm here in this bookstore I've got <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> to find a book um, you know maybe if I see oh this one's number one on the bestseller list you know maybe I'll pick that one up uh, or uh, maybe I heard from a colleague I highly respect uh, about a book you know anything along those lines is, is the social proof and very powerful uh, form of uh, persuasion there and there's been plenty of studies too where they basically set people up <laughs> a lot of famous studies you probably have heard of them uh, but sometimes they, they almost gaslight people you know, they'll find somebody that doesn't realize everybody else there is in on this <laughs> game basically <laughs> and they will say something that's just factually incorrect you know I see uh, three lights instead of four or something and they'll find that the, the social proof is so powerful that a lot of times even though it's just plainly evident that that's wrong uh, just the fact that everybody else there seems to think it's right uh, so this person will say yeah they're right um, just because they, st they start to question them themselves basically so that you know that's how powerful that that is it's almost kind of scary really uh, and then over here to a liking uh, so a principle of influence whereby people are more likely to be persuaded by people who they like right and I think you could add add to this people that are like them so they're not just people they like but people who are like them uh, that's a lot more influential than if you uh, obviously if you don't like a person or you feel like this person doesn't get you uh, you're probably not going to uh, be persuaded by them of course again a classic example being kids and parents you know the kids get to a certain age and they, you know they no longer see their parents as uh, uh, people they like they want to be like uh, so they're, they're looking for somebody else uh, to be their role model yeah, see understanding the methods of influence oh yeah here's some a couple more uh, authority a principle of influence whereby people follow uh, authority figures and this is almost ingrained in us uh, if you see somebody in a uniform or a suit and tie uh, looking uh, important right you tend to want to uh, follow them obviously in, in ac academia as well you know there's a reason we have uh, professors teaching classes right because we have a certain authority <laughs> by virtue of the classes we've taken the degrees we have diplomas on the wall all this sort of thing uh, books you've written on and on and on uh, makes people more likely to want to uh, listen to what you have to say uh, and scarcity and this one I think is really interesting you know I, wouldn't have, I, would, I don't know if I would have thought about this one but this is a principle of influence whereby people think think there is a limited availability of something they want or need uh, so they must act quickly so you probably heard that a million times in television advertisements you know act act now <laughs> that was a I always joke around with my, my wife and I uh, there's a store in used to be in st. Cloud called big lots 
uh, that we went to all the time. And <laughs> sadly, they closed the store. Uh, but th when they were, you know, as they were in the process of uh, closing, uh, they, they would they had some sales going on, and <laughs> they kept saying over and over <laughs> on their intercom, you know, something like a buy something, you know, the sales are 20% off, whatever. Uh, but the catchphrase was, I get it now because once they're gone, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept saying that over and over. So I guess that's a, the idea of scarcity, right? If you don't buy it now, you won't have the chance to do it tomorrow. And, you know, just while I'm thinking about this too, another very common tactic of uh, those car salespeople is, is to make out like, or when you're buying a house or anything, even if this person hasn't gotten another call, nobody's wanted to visit this house in months. And they'll still make out like, oh, yeah, you, well, you, you better sign these papers quickly because, uh, you know, I'm going to be showing this house to you know, four different people tomorrow <laughs> or after you're gone. Somebody else wants to come and look at it and they seem pretty interested. Right. Or I don't know if we're going to be able to offer this sale tomorrow. You know, I'm, I can only give you this deal today if you do it right now, because uh, what they find, of course, is that once you get home, start thinking about it, you'll probably talk yourself out of it. Uh, so they really want to get you, you know, strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. Uh, see, I told you I like this topic. <laughs> it's, just, it's endlessly fascinating to me. <laughs> uh, persuasion through emotion and reason. Uh, so right, yeah, we were talking about this before that even though it you might be something really boring, uh, some type of uh, marketing plan analysis. Uh, database software, just something where you think there's really no emotion. This is just strictly fact-based decision making. Uh, there's really no such thing as that. At least if you actually want to make the sale, the, you know, the emotion is always a key component of a persuasive message. People aren't computers; we're not robots. <laughs> a lot of times, just a little bit of uh, the right emotion will make a sale, uh, even in the face of superior uh, advantages, technically speaking. So these effective communicators find ways to appeal to the core emotional benefits of products, services, and ideas. Uh, so think about that, the core emotional benefit of a product, a service, or ideas. And it could be anything from a charity. There's lots of emotions around, uh, like the Humane Society offers a service, right? <laughs> yeah, the Tri-County Humane Society. Uh, but if you go to their website, you're going to be inundated with all the emotional benefits of supporting them, uh, that's going to have a lot more impact on you than any kind of statistics they have there uh, or uh, legalese or boilerplate, uh, anything of that sort. You know, and the same thing with products. Uh, a lot of times uh, you'll be what is called the uh, the victim of marketing, right? The <laughs> marketing victims. <laughs> so you just spent, you know, $30 on a Yeti mug. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty of that. Uh, just because there was some kind of emotional resonance, it, something about the, you know, something connected to you emotionally about this Yeti mug, and you're willing to, to spend the extra 10 bucks <laughs> instead of, uh, to get that one instead of the knockoff or the uh, thermos mug. All right, so moving on to the uh, right information. Uh, so we say, obviously, that's uh, critical for persuasive messages. And if you don't have the, you know, if I'm, uh, looking for coming back to these uh, resumes uh, for example All right so if you if you know obviously the say education are you trained are you qualified uh, to do the job you know that would be the right information that <laughs> needs to be on that uh, resume so if it's not there obviously there's a, a critical problem uh, they do get a couple other considerations here though uh, one is if the audience is resistant to the mess to the message then it becomes a key task uh, to establish credibility. All right, so I th coming back to the resumes again, you know, if there's some, maybe they're asking for five years of experience and you've only got one year, well, you, you don't have any uh, professional experience. So you could imagine how in that case, well, yes, you're going to have to work, you know, double hard, <laughs> a lot harder than somebody else that does have that uh, to establish your credibility. But if you're aware of that, if you're aware of that need to do that, you can prepare a lot better than somebody that just goes in there <laughs> naively. Uh, developing strong ideas in the interests of your audience helps you demonstrate your voice of confidence. So developing strong ideas in the interest of your audience helps you demonstrate your voice of confidence. 
Uh, so th again, this is why I tell those job seekers, you know, really try to understand what is it about this company? Why are they hiring? You know, what are they looking for? Uh, what makes their office different than other offices? Is there anything <laughs> that they have a special need to fill? Uh, and if you can figure out what that is and really emphasize that, uh, that's going to go a long ways towards establishing uh, your competence. So, for example, if there's a particular type of software uh, this company uses and, and you bother to figure out <laughs> what, what that is and, and how to use it and you mention it, uh, that might give you a big edge uh, over somebody else that, that doesn't bother. You know, thinking too about all the foods and people have all these allergies nowadays. <laughs> I guess they've always had them, but uh, anyway, you know, I, I hear all the time at restaurants now they'll be asking the servers, you know, well, does this does this dish have uh, nuts in it or does it have onions in it? Uh, you know, is it made with with this type of oil? <laughs> you know, whatever it is, and the good servers, you know, they always know the answers to those questions. Uh, whereas if they say, I don't know, <laughs> I have to go ask, <laughs> it kind of makes the person, usually the, when I'm in, you know, with these people I'm talking about, they'll say, well, well you know, if, if you, you never mind, then I'll just order something else because <laughs> they don't want to take the risk because uh, they don't trust the, uh, you know, if that person doesn't know right off the top of their head, they assume <laughs> for whatever reason, maybe they shouldn't trust them. You know, it's kind of hard to say exactly what's going on there, but uh, you, you might have friends like that. Uh, so you might be able to chime in. All right, some components of persuasive messages. Uh, one of the courses is to gain attention. <laughs> if people just ignore your message, well, you're not going to persuade them <laughs> very well, are you, if they don't, don't even open the email or open the letter. Uh, so that's uh, first step. How do you get somebody's attention? Sounds easy, not really very easy. Uh, raising a need. So how are you going to benefit them? Why do they need you? Uh, then deliver the solution, provide the rationale. So a lot of this is a carryover from last time, right? We had the same, the same sorts of uh, components, a few differences. I like this one, validate the views, preferences, and concerns of others. Uh, so thinking about this uh, restaurant example again, if somebody says, well, you know, does this product or does that dish have peanuts in it? I'm allergic to peanuts. You know, if that server was to respond with, oh, you know, that's <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, uh, you're not going to, you'll be fine. You know, if it sounds like they don't care about or they're not concerned about this person's allergies. Uh, of course, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that if her person just walked out of the restaurant. Uh, whereas if they showed that they were concerned, well, obviously that would make a, a big deal. Um, you know, what's important to the, the person, right? Uh, let's see what else we have here. Give uh, counterpoints. <laughs> they put optional here because really uh, arguing with somebody very seldom works. You know, it's better, <laughs> it's better to agree with them <laughs> than to just try to refute them because every time you refute them, you just diminish your, uh, you diminish all these other stuff we've been talking about, the shared values and uh, you know, concern for the person. Uh, even if you're right, you know, what is that they say? The the customer is always right. <laughs> I know it, there's been some challenges to that lately. And I don't know if I agree, but that's, I think, kind of the key. Yeah, you can argue with them, but is it really going to be achieving the goal or not? Uh, that's the question. And then finally, the call to action. Like, what do you want them to do? Uh, again, people tend to uh, skip this critical step. You know, they write this great job letter, this great application letter, but they won't put in there <laughs> the crucial line, <laughs> you know, please call me to arrange an interview, or please uh, hire me for this job, or please <laughs> go to this website and become a member. All right, so some different ways to uh, set up the message. And we'll look at a couple different ways here. And this is a, probably one of the most critical differences between this and those routine messages we were talking about before. Uh, usually in a business writing situation, professional uh, writing, you, you want to be as direct as possible. You know, what is it? What is your purpose for writing? You know, the, what's the main idea of the argument? Um, you know, what's the point of this? And then you later go into some support for it. You know, why should you do this, etc. Uh, the other alternatives, though, um, Oh, well, this is a going on with the, <laughs> that initial approach. <laughs> yeah, so it's direct and explicit, uh, the traditional 
message, right? Something that's not necessarily uh, persuasive, but where the audience is likely to agree with you. Uh, so there's nothing implied there. Everything is, is out in the open. It's, it's unambiguous, it's transparent. Yeah, uh, so that's the traditional types of messages. But if you're trying to be persuasive, you might want to consider this other approach. So instead of being direct and explicit, you might want to be indirect and implicit. Uh, so by indirect, you're providing the rationale for a request before making the specific request. Uh, so you might go on for a while about a problem and then only at the end, you know, say what, what you think should be done uh, to address the problem uh, or implicit. So some of the rationale may just be implied, uh, not spelled out <laughs> for whatever reason. And they say the reader needs to read between the lines uh, to grasp the entire meaning. All right, so a lot of times this is effective too. If you get somebody to uh, think about the message, uh, sometimes that can have a persuasive impact. Uh, so let's look at some effective attention getters. You know, this is what usually people have the most fun with. So let's say you're trying to be persuasive Trying to write this persuasive memo, email. What are some, you know, time-honored strategies? <laughs> First one they list here is rhetorical questions. This is what most of my students uh, use as their examples when I ask them this. So here's an example of a rhetorical question. Uh, did you know that average credit union members save four hundred dollars per year compared to bank customers? So that's a pretty good. You know, a pretty good attention getter, right? You see, four hundred dollars per year. You probably start thinking, like, what could I buy for four hundred dollars? <laughs> that sounds like a lot of money. Uh, so that could get your attention that way. Now, obviously, they don't. They probably don't expect you to answer. Yes, I knew that, or, or no, I didn't. <laughs> Just a rhetorical question, uh, meaning they don't really expect a response, or they're not seriously asking you the question uh, for debate or discussion, right? Uh, the other thing, uh, the most common, the intriguing statistic, uh, statistic. So in the past five years, this is an example. In the past five years, we've lost over 200 members, over 10% of our membership. Uh, so that sounds pretty serious. <laughs> you got some numbers in there, some stats. Uh, it wouldn't be very impressive if it was, you know, in the past five years, we've lost two members, only 0.05% of our membership. Who cares, right? Uh, this only works if there's something intriguing uh, about the statistics. Maybe in this case, I guess frightening. Uh, compelling and unusual facts. Uh, you've probably heard car dealers boast about their near 0% interest rates, but there's a catch. Let's see, we've got an exc exc exclamation point. Uh, by financing with car dealers, you give up your opportunity to receive manufacturer rebates and your power to negotiate on price. So I don't know about you. This one kind of worked on me. <laughs> I just recently uh, got a couple of new vehicles, or we did. And I think, I don't remember if we went through the bank or the credit union or the, uh, pretty sure we just went through the, the car dealership, but <laughs> this kind of got me thinking. <laughs> Maybe I made a mistake there. Uh, so even these examples in the book are pretty powerful uh, with these unusual facts. And if this, if this is true, you know, we made a big mistake. Uh, challenge. Another uh, another type of attention getter. Uh, please join our team in this year's Hope Walkathon in the fight against breast cancer. I guess that's what they consider a challenge. <laughs> a challenge to be more like I dare double, double dog dare you <laughs> uh, to do that, right? Uh, testimonial. Uh, yeah, these are very common, obviously. Uh, so you find a customer that's satisfied, <laughs> hopefully a real customer, not just an actor. <laughs> the, the following message was, was brought to you by a paid actor. Uh, I never knew I could have so much negotiating power with a pre-approved loan. By getting my car loan through Better Horizons, I negotiated a great deal with a car dealer. <laughs> this is the way to buy cars. <laughs> yeah. All right, so getting the tone and style right for a persuasive message. They talk about the need for a personal touch. You know, a lot of these uh, salespeople, again, it's they get to know you. Uh, you know, like the car dealer, the car salesperson we've worked with, so also named Matt over there at uh, the Dodge Jeep Dodge place. <laughs> yeah, he, he seems to he. It's not like we spent like days with the guy, but you know, he knows my name, knows my wife's name. Uh, knows what kind of vehicles we, we've got. Uh, so whenever we interact with them, it's almost like a, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's like being there with a friend or a neighbor, uh, but it's certainly a lot more personal. I, th I think that's one reason that 
you know, we wanted to buy from him uh, because of that personal touch. You know, if you go somewhere else, they don't even ask you your name. They don't remember it. Uh, you, you're there the next day. They don't recognize you. <laughs> you know, that probably doesn't have the best uh, the, the best impact. Uh, although I will say sometimes people overdo it with this. You know, sometimes you're just not in the mood for a lot of uh, uh, chit chat. <laughs> you just want to get this transaction over and done with. <laughs> uh, you don't want to, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. All right, use action oriented, lively language. We'll look at some examples of that. Uh, writing with confidence. You know, always important when you're trying to get somebody to make a major investment like a car or a house. Uh, offer choices and show positivity. All right, so we'll be talking here about some different kinds of voice in persuasive uh, messages. And they start with this idea of the you voice, which you might have been told in your freshman uh, or English 191, you should never use you in a paper. <laughs> well, it's sometimes it's entirely appropriate. Uh, and they give the case where it is appropriate. It's appropriate to use you and talk directly to the reader or the viewer or whoever if it's an external persuasive message to emphasize reader benefits. So how is this going to benefit me? Uh, why should I go through the credit union and, and deal with all that uh, when the car dealer there is just happy to do it <laughs> you know, right then and there? <laughs> uh, so you're gonna have to make some a pretty good case. And I wanna know, like me personally, what are the benefits for me? Uh, that makes sense in that case to use the uh, you voice oriented towards the reader. They say there's a, they caution you. The caution is that it can come across as presumptuous, assuming that you know what is good for someone else. And that, you know, the classic <laughs> example again is a parent <laughs> uh, lecturing their children, right? Well, you know, I know you want that candy, uh, but <laughs> you know, you better eat those vegetables because uh, I know more than you do about the diet and health. And <laughs> you know, there's a million. I'm sure you can think of plenty of examples. Uh, let's see what example they came up with. Uh, uh, when you take out an auto loan, you get a variety of resources to help you when you're car shopping, including a free copy of a Kelly Blue Book, access to free Carfax reports, mechanical breakdown insurance, and guaranteed auto protection. Uh, so this, I guess, if you go through the credit union to get this car loan, you get all this basically free stuff. Uh, so that works out pretty well. Now let's see what these, they have a little caveat here. Uh, overuse, however, may come across as presumptuous, overbearing, <laughs> or exaggerating. <laughs> yes, uh, you had better get this <laughs> loan through the credit union, <laughs> punk. <laughs> uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, the wave voice. Uh, so instead of using you should do this, you do that, uh, we're talking about we. They say this only makes, or this, the most appropriate case is an internal persuasive message to emphasize a shared work goal. So that's kind of the key. If you don't have a shared work goal, <laughs> that's not going to work. And again, it's kind of the problem. If you overdo it, you might come across as presumptuous, assuming you share common beliefs, ideas, or understanding uh, with your colleagues. I mean, a lot of times, uh, you know, I go to a conference or, uh, you know, one of these uh, meetings, uh, convocations or whatever, and there's, there's kind of a starry-eyed individual up there giving these, uh, well, you know, we, we all value this <laughs> over everything, and you're kind of rolling your eyes and thinking, yeah, 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 <laughs> sure we do. <laughs> we don't care about, uh, you know, uh, ordinary things like paychecks. <laughs> we only uh, share the, the ideals of uh, uh, the greatest education, you know, something like this. You know, it can't come across as presumptuous. Now, let's look at their examples. Uh, at Better Horizons, we've instilled a personal touch into every aspect of our business. We've reinforced this culture with face-to-face -face services. Our tellers welcome members by name, and when they come into the blah, 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 blah. And so they're saying the we there instills a sense of shared values, priorities, and goals. And so if I recall correctly, the book was saying that th at this credit union, they want to uh, start putting some stuff online, I guess developing some apps. Uh, ATMs and kind of getting away from this face-to-face -face model, uh, but some of the folks that had worked there for a long time didn't like this. They, they were saying, well, that's what makes the credit union special, is that we do have this personal touch. Here you are wanting to uh, 
destroy all that with a <laughs> website. <laughs> and so in that case, it was important to do, use this we voice to try to, you know, show we, we do share values, priorities, and goals here. Uh, so it's not like we're opposing uh, the time-tested model. And then the I voice, uh, which I think this is <laughs> unfortunately most of the students' default setting. You know, I've said many times about like the resumes and cover letters, it's all me, 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 look how great I am. This is the me show starring me, <laughs> with me directing, me producing, <laughs> and really nothing there at all uh, about the, the you, uh, much less the, the we. Uh, so they say, and I think I'd agree, uh, use in persuasive message, uh, messages uh, sparingly. You know, it does definitely, <laughs> man, I could, you know, really need to bold and highlight this. Overuse implies self-centeredness. And, you know, think about anybody in your life that you would describe as self-centered. And probably the first thing you think about is, you know, they're always telling you about themselves, something that's, you know, their life, uh, their hobby, <laughs> something that happened uh, to them, their interest. Uh, and they hardly ever ask you about yours. And it's just they, they only care about themselves only, not even interested in, in what you have to say or, or your opinion. And so usually that comes across poorly. You know, we don't I don't really care what the salesperson thinks, <laughs> what the sales, what car the salesperson would choose necessarily. You know, I'm looking for something that fits with my values and preferences. Uh, you know, and software makers have figured that out, too. That's why they build in all this ability to personalize your uh, you know, your desktop and so on. So let's look at their example. After examining the result, results of other credit unions, I am convinced that these tools can build emotional connections and loyalty with our members. Uh, so they're saying here it is appropriate because it shows a personal opinion and shows respect for audience members who are not yet fully persuaded. Um, however, it may come across as emphasizing your interests rather than those of the audience. And then lastly, the last method is this, basically not to have a voice at all, uh, to be impersonal. And they say that sometimes is appropriate. Uh, if you're emphasizing objectivity, neutrality, and probably the most common case where you see this would be scientific writing. It's not supposed to matter who did the exper experiment, <laughs> what those scientists' uh, opinions or beliefs are. Uh, that's supposed to be neither here nor there. Uh, the only thing that's important is, you know, did they do the study objectively? Uh, were they neutral or were they biased? You know, I guess that's the key to this is avoiding that biased tone. Uh, however, again, there's a problem with overusing. It may depersonalize the message, not to mention make it really boring. You know, too much passive voice especially uh, can make things really tedious to read. Uh, it, it's just almost dry. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of dries you up <laughs> reading it. Uh, let's see. Uh, the basic difference, this is the example. Uh, the basic difference between a credit union and a bank is that credit union members own and control their credit unions, whereas bank account holders have no stake or control in their financial situations. And so they're saying they're using the uh, impersonal there to show objectivity. Um, you wouldn't want to say, in my opinion, uh, the basic difference between credit unions and banks. You know, that's not your opinion. <laughs> it's just a fact, right? <laughs> or at least what they're trying to present as a fact. Uh, so if you, uh, I know a lot of you are teaching, or teachers, so you probably see your students do this all the time, use this, in my opinion, or personally, or something like this, uh, they'll use that inappropriately, when really they just need to state it as a, you know, as their position or as a fact. Uh, tangibility. Uh, so by de a definition, tangible uh, means something that can be touched. You can, you can put your hands on that thing. It's a material or substantial. And so in, you know, you, in the classroom scenario, this might be bringing in a, an artifact. <laughs> if you're talking about history, <laughs> uh, maybe you bring in some artifacts you can pass around the room that people touch. Or uh, think about a biology class lab uh, where you actually get to do a dissection. Uh, that's sort of the idea, the realm that we're in here. Uh, but we want to think instead about the business communications context. Uh, so when we're saying tangible in that context, we mean something the readers can discern, or something it implies. <laughs> Let me try this three times. Uh, so if it's tangible, uh, that means the readers can discern something in terms that are meaningful to them. Uh, this allows the reader to sense the impact on a personal level. 
And again, they, one of the most common pieces of advice you get in sales and marketing is people care about themselves and, and their own and their families <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> if it's something that doesn't have an impact on them, well, they'll probably just uh, you know move on. You know, they'll think, well, this doesn't apply to me. You know, we got enough stuff on our plate. We don't want to get mixed up in stuff that has no bearing uh, on our lives. You know, what's the old uh, cliche? What, what, what does that have to do with the price of tea? <laughs> in china <laughs> you know something like that's kind of this this has no personal connection to me and so that's one of the jobs if you listen to uh, npr if you ever had the misfortune of uh, tuning into npr during one of their pledge drives they really have a hard time uh, establishing this and they have to keep hammering on this over and over because they're dealing with something that's so intangible i mean you feel like what am i paying for you know, uh, signals through the air <laughs> that come to, to the radio. You know, I have to pay for the electricity to, to run this radio and, and so on and so forth. So it's not clear necessarily. Like, how is that uh, supporting NPR? How does that impact me on a personal level, right? And you think, well, a lot of other people will donate. You got all these companies, sponsors donating. Uh, what's my 20 bucks a month or whatever it is? How, how is that going to matter? Uh, so the, uh, what do you call them, the <laughs> announcers on the show, <laughs> the NPR people, uh, they have to make a real clear case for this. Like, well, this does impact you. Uh, you kind of still have to wonder sometimes, but they, they try to make it sound like, well, what if you, I remember one of them was saying one, one day, like, what if you woke up one morning and you turned on the radio and there was just nothing but static? Because <laughs> the NPR station was off the air, uh, you know, and that kind of did have an impact. I thought, well, that would be kind of kind of bad. You know, where would I go for my uh, news? <laughs> As that finally uh, finally kind of touched me on a personal level, I remember that. <clears throat> Let's look at some uh, more and less effective uh, tangible statements. Uh, so the less effective statement: uh, Credit unions save members about eight dollar. What are we looking at? Let me start over. Credit unions save members about $8 billion a year thanks to better interest rates and reduced fees. So you see, they're talking about this $8 billion amount uh, across the entire credit union industry. <laughs> now, it's, it's basically impossible to picture really like $8 billion a year. Now, that's more money than most of us <laughs> or any of us will ever see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not very tangible. You can't really wrap your head around that. It uh, definitely doesn't have that personal impact. Now, the other example, though, now I think these are really good examples, so kind of focus in here. Uh, so above, they're talking about $8 billion a year across the entire credit union industry. In the second example, though, they say, on average, credit union members save $400 each year compared to bank customers thanks to lower uh, loan uh, rates and fees. Now, $400 is a lot easier to wrap your head around uh, than $8 billion a year. So just in that alone, you know, they've made something a lot more tangible. Uh, you can sort of see how that works. And then, you know, of course, this is the, <laughs> coming back to NPR again. You know, they don't ask you to spend uh, $1,200 a year. You know, they break it down into months or sometimes even days. They'll say, you know, for 10 cents a day, <laughs> for a nickel a day, whatever. <laughs> you know, they make it seem a little more tangible um, or a little less frightening to you than if they said <laughs> the 1200 or $2,000 a year. You know, I don't know what all this, you know, you, you do the math if you like, but if they put it that way, it'd probably scare people off. It wouldn't seem practical. It seemed like, a, well, that's unrealistic for me to spend that much. But a nickel a day, you know, okay, that's fine. Or sometimes they'll say, for the price of a cup of coffee, you know, you could <laughs> do this and that. <laughs> now let's look at this other example. Uh, in recent years, many credit unions have lost membership because younger individuals are not attracted to them. Let's say again, that doesn't have the, the impact. If you look at this other example, though, in the past five years, we've lost over 200 members, over 10% of our membership, and we simply aren't attracting younger members. So again, this is something I stress a lot in the uh, when I talk about resumes too. Uh, you know, the more numbers you can work in, the better. You know, if you just say I improved uh, customer service, that's less effective. It's vague. You know, what what do you mean? If you could put some numbers in there, in there like 
uh, in the past five years I've worked at this company, uh, subscriptions are up 10%. We now have, uh, you know, 500, or I guess over five years, you'd want more than that, but <laughs> you know, uh, thousands of new, uh, 1,200 new members. Uh, that really has that impact. Uh, let me look at some other examples. Yeah, so this one just is breaking down the uh, uh, the amounts they could save. So instead of just saying our car, car loan rates are between 1.5 and 1.75 percentage points lower than at any of the banks in town, this doesn't really mean anything to me. I don't know what that means. Uh, percentage point, huh? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> but if you look at the second example, though, you know, here they've actually gone in and done the math to make this a little more tangible. Uh, so instead of just saying 1.5 percentage points lower, you know, whatever that means, they say on a four-year $15,000 new car loan, you save about 680 bucks. Yeah, so this is a lot more direct. Notice also how they broke this up into some bullets. So you probably, your eye kind of drifts to these numbers and you can see, oh, well, <laughs> $15,000. That's must, I don't know what kind of car is that cheap. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you get an idea of, wow, 680 bucks. That's, that's worth, you know, now you're getting into the amount of money that makes it seem like that would be worth uh, going through the hassle of, uh, you know, figuring out how to get this car loan through the, the credit union. You're putting tangible numbers in there that people can wrap their head around. And some other examples here, just, this is kind of just language, wordsmithing, basically. So the Betty Williams Breast Center has a nationally accredited program, so has, versus more active uh, voice, more active verb, I should say. Uh, the Betty Williams Breast Cancer runs a nationally accredited program. So instead of just saying has, we got runs, applies a little bit more, more action there. Here's some other examples. Uh, same thing here, Better Horizons has always been known for its personal approach to our members. Our transactions have always occurred through face-to-face -face services. Our tellers are friendly to all members. So they're saying, look at those verbs. You know, we've got these has been known, have occurred, are, you know, passive verbs, linking verbs, I used to call them. <laughs> and if you compare it to the second example, at Better Horizons, we've instilled a personal touch and we've reinforced this culture uh, when members come into the credit union, they know we care about them as people, not just as customers. So think about that instead of uh, our tellers are friendly to all members versus when members come into the credit union, you kind of pictured this in your head, right? The members, you know, I kind of like to get into the reader's head. Like <laughs> you can sort of imagine this. I, I kind of see the glass doors, right? There's a member coming through the door <laughs> into the credit union. It kind of puts a little image in my mind. I can sort of see that mentally. Uh, they know we care about them as people, uh, not just as customers. So I'm not, you know, this is not going to, uh, <laughs> it's not groundbreaking stuff really. It's just a little bit more uh, visible mentally uh, than just saying they're friendly to everybody. All right, now we get into writing with confidence. You know, it helps to have the confidence, but <laughs> uh, let's see, less effective. At our upcoming board meeting, I would like to discuss possible ways of appealing to younger members. We can talk about how various strategies might appeal to this group. Now, this is a reason. This is one of the problems that plagues uh, <laughs> professors and academics. You know, we tend to be very. We tend to qualify everything. Uh, tend to be basically wishy-washy uh, because you know you've you've seen plenty of times when uh, statements are proven wrong. People challenge things. It's harder to argue with people when they're qualifying everything. Uh, well, yeah, various strategies. I like to discuss possible ways of appealing to. It's kind of watered down. You know, that might work in an academic context, but again, if you're trying to be persuasive, uh, you're not really uh, going to help very much with this. Uh, yeah, yeah, this, this explanation makes sense. So they're showing sensitivity. However, they're not showing confidence. So maybe a little bit too much sensitivity, not enough confidence. And they'll, you know, the book will tell you that the, it's, it's kind of hard to strike this balance, walk this rope between uh, the sensitivity and the confidence. But, but let's look at their uh, better example. Uh, at our upcoming board meeting, I will present a vision 
of how we can build marketing strategies and product offerings to appeal to younger members. These strategies will not only attract younger members to our credit union, but also increase our business across other age groups. Uh, so here it's definitely not as uh, wishy-washy, not as qualified, sounds a little bit more confident, maybe <laughs> a little too much, you know, you could decide that. Just depends on how resistant the audience uh, would be to this. Uh, but yeah, there's an excitement about some possibilities there. <laughs> Writing with confidence, <laughs> less effective. Uh, please think about how better Horizons can help you in your banking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, non-specific, weak, unconfident. You know, yeah, it does almost sound like they're uh, insecure, doesn't it? Uh, more effective. We encourage you to stop by Better Horizons and make direct comparisons with your current bank. You'll find that banking with Better Horizons saves you money, provides convenience, offers services. Yeah, so they say that kind of lays down a challenge, right? If you stop by. Come by, let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can outperform the, the bank and give you a better deal. <laughs> uh, let's see, less effective. Uh, this kind of reminds me of the Dwight Schrute clip we uh, started off with. And so here we're talking about emphasizing choice. And they say the hard sells, hard, the hard sells increasingly ineffective, especially in a written format. Uh, high pressure sales tactics, you know, high pressure. Nobody likes that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if they ever did. <laughs> uh, so let's look at some of these examples. Uh, you owe it, you owe it uh, to the women in your lives to make a difference. And they say this appeal focuses on obligation and pressure. Uh, most readers will not respond positively to that. Uh, so let's compare it to their more effective example. You can help make a difference for women. You, you, you can help make a difference for women here in our community. Uh, so instead of you owe it to the women in your lives to make a difference, uh, we have you can help make a difference for women here in our community. And they say that second one appeal, that second appeal focuses on volunteerism and contribution to the community without telling you uh, what to do. All right, so you get to feel good about volunteering and contributing. It's not that this is something that you have to do because it's the right thing, darn it. <laughs> Instead of that kind of appeal, uh, you know, we're, we're saying, you know, here's an opportunity, right, to, to shine, to show how good of a person you are, <laughs> how good of a citizen you are. And people uh, like that better than that you know, high pressure approach. I think that's true. And it's like an, another one, less effective. <laughs> they say this request is a guilt trip. Okay. Uh, so this is the guilt trip. The walkathon will be held on Saturday, October 6 at 9, 9 o'clock a.m. at Central Park. Do your part to improve the lives of women in our community. <laughs> Do your part to improve the lives of women in our community. Uh, so they say that's a guilt trip emphasizes duty. All right. So this, you know, the idea behind this is if you don't go, uh, it's almost like you're not doing your part. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. You, you, did, you don't care about the women in our community. Uh, so that's why they said that's a, a guilt trip. Not really very effective. So it's more effective to have something like this. Uh, the walkathon will be held, blah, blah, blah. Uh, please join Betty and the rest of the Better Horizons team for a day of fun, excitement, and hope. Uh, so this is emphasizing our choice to participate. <laughs> it's not that we have to do this or we're rotten people if we don't do it. Uh, you know, instead of that kind of appeal, it's, you know, come on, come on, it'll be fun. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> and, you know, and even better, you'll be doing some uh, some good for the community. Uh, so I, I think you'd probably agree with that. Uh, definitely seems to be better. Uh, statements to avoid in the post-trust era. So we're back again to this idea of a post-trust era and people thinking if it sounds too good to be true it probably is uh, so examples that don't work the trust me kind of statement <laughs> yeah literally trust trust me <laughs> we speak your language uh, unbelievable uh, your call is important to us yes yeah, that's, that's the that's the one that gets made fun of all the time right the, <laughs> yeah well if your call was important to us if my call was important to you, I wouldn't be on, on hold right now. <laughs> I would be talking to somebody instead of waiting for half an hour uh, for them to, for you to eventually decide to call me back. Yeah, if I'm lucky. <laughs> we care about our customers, right? 
just kind of nobody really believes this, uh, especially when they don't even have the greeter. <laughs> <laughs> the greeter's not even there <laughs> all right uh too good to be true yeah this is the, the right product for you uh, we give you guaranteed results or, you know think about all the political claims right just just vote for me and, and everything will be wonderful you, you know, all your problems will be solved <laughs> you know nobody's that gullible uh hopefully uh, excuses what you need to understand is what Walmart <laughs> profits are down <laughs> our hands are tied we had no choice but to, to lay off these greeters yeah right um, explanations uh, this was taken out of context or, or I can explain yeah this one's funny there's a uh, I've got a Christmas uh, stocking somebody I don't know who got it probably my I don't know who bought this for me, <laughs> but I have a little Christmas stocking that says uh, Santa. I can explain. <laughs> so that, thought that was funny. Uh, fear tactics. Uh, are you concerned about the security of your family? <laughs> what is this like? The, the uh, a mobster? Yeah, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Act now, or you'll miss this opportunity. All right? And you know, like the, you know, again, the car dealers, the house. Uh, even I was skeptical. I never bought a house before, but you know, I was working with two or three different, working with a couple of different agents, and they, they kept saying that, like, oh, well, <laughs> you better make a decision quickly, <laughs> like, because, you know, I've got four other people coming to look at this house after you. Yeah, right, come on. You know, once you start to question somebody uh, with that, you start to question everything, and you probably don't want to uh, do business with that person, just just based on that. Let's see, avoiding exaggerations and superlatives. Uh, you can trust us at Better Horizons. <laughs> you can trust us at Better Horizons to make your financial dreams come true. <laughs> yeah, you don't need me to tell you why that's silly. Uh, let's look at the other one. Uh, pay attention to these facts or risk losing money to banks. And so they say this statement focuses on fear and applies pressure. Most customers don't consider that credible. Uh, more effective. Consider some of the following reasons to join Better Horizons and start saving today. Yes, yeah, so a little bit more inviting, a little less <laughs> threatening. Oh, so components of internal and external persuasive messages. Uh, we talked about these, the, the attention statement, overview of the problem or catchy statement. Basically, this is, you know, if it's going to be circulated just within the office or is it going outside of the office to customers? Uh, so you probably wouldn't want a catchy statement if it was just internal. You know, there you're talking about problems to be solved, not uh, opportunities necessarily. Uh, description of the problem versus description of unmet needs or wants of customers. Uh, descriptions of how your idea of policy addresses the business problem versus elaborating about why your product or service benefits the customers. And so we could go on, but I think you can see basically the uh, the shift in focus is going from uh, the in the first one just what's <laughs> about the problem uh, on the table versus the external message, which is concerned about the customers and their needs and, and how will this benefit them. You, know, you can think again about these resumes. You, know, you might have the same kind of information on a resume as opposed to us. Uh, like your customer, your your uh, employee profile, let's say, uh, with HR, uh, but you're not really con trying to convince uh, anyone, you know, within HR. You know, even though it's the same kind of information that was on the resume, uh, since it's internal, uh, there'll be a different structure, different focus, different style, different tone, uh, all the way down the board. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. <laughs> That's the one I like. <laughs> the less effective internal persuasive message. All right, so right off the bat, the subject line just says upcoming meeting. doesn't say what the meeting is about. Uh, why should I go to the meeting? Am I required to go to the meeting? Nothing there. Uh, let's see. The need is non-tangible. you got a vague solution. Non-specific. It uh, doesn't validate other perspectives. Non-specific. So basically, it's all the problems that we were looking at uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, we're just everything's vague. It's the tone is bossy. Uh, just lots of problems. Oh, we don't have the. Usually they give you a uh, a good one to contrast it with. <laughs> I guess not this time. 
Uh, so the external persuasive message. Uh, so these, again, they should be personalized. You know, talked about this, personal touch, upbeat, positive, free of pressure. You know, you're not trying to uh, strong arm anybody uh, with this. That's just going to uh, you put them on the defensive. Uh, you're not trying to make people uh, feel guilty. <laughs> Use just extremely uh, negative terms. You know, uh, one of the examples that keeps coming to my, popping up in my mind is this: uh, uh, the Humane Society and the uh, what's the uh, can't think of the name of the agency, but there's one that's always advertising television commercials uh, with these dogs, you know, the abandoned dogs, and they talk about how the uh, these dogs have been mistreated and all this stuff. Makes you feel really sad uh, for the dogs, uh, but they don't. You know, you could imagine how it would be ineffective if they were <laughs> saying, "Look at what you are. Look at what you've done." <laughs> you know, trying to blame you, uh, make you feel guilty, uh, as though you're somehow responsible for that. Uh, they don't take that approach, at least not usually. Uh, usually it's more in the spirit of uh, you can do something to help, right? <laughs> uh, so instead of being making you feel guilty, it makes you feel good about helping. Uh, let's see, mass sells uh, messages. So this, you know, spam basically, <laughs> uh, or maybe not. You know, maybe this is like the letter that goes out to, uh, to everybody that's in a particular bracket and you're trying to sell the product, the service. And again, the, the challenge here is you don't necessarily know who it is. You don't know a lot about the individual reading the letter. Uh, so you have to make a lot of assumptions. Uh, so this ultimately won't be as effective. You know, this is why uh, Facebook is making so much money and Google. I mean, these companies have become behemoths, billions and billions of dollars because they are able to uh, even just with the limited means at their disposal to, to give uh, these advertisers a little bit of information <laughs> about the individual customers, you know, the people on that website. And, and the information they provide lets the advertisers and marketers uh, zero in and focus more uh, on that person, make it more personal to the uh, potential customer. And, you know, that makes all the difference. Uh, so it's so much more effective uh, than just a television commercial that's going out over the, you know, a news program and everybody sees the same commercial. It's not in any way personalized uh, towards them. You know, basically the only thing they could do is just a brute force approach and just show the same commercial thousands and thousands of times and <laughs> just hopes that they can sort of bash it into you. Uh, that's much, much less effective uh, than these ads that can pop up on Facebook. Uh, where they've, they know enough about you to be able to target the ad. Uh, so I say all that because it just kind of has a way to lead into this idea of what makes us this so hard uh, to do a good mass sales message. Uh, so it, it's a you know, big challenge and people that are good at this, you know, they, they, they command high salaries. <laughs> That's why you hear sometimes, <laughs> wow, this charity? Are you telling me this nonprofit organization has a CEO who makes seven figures? <laughs> you know, they're making a, this huge salary and they're supposed to be a charity. You know, people have a, people always get upset about that. But <laughs> really, <laughs> it's that person has a, a, a particular skill set, right? They're good at making these uh, mass sales messages and it's, it's not easy. You know, everybody thinks this is just so easy. Anybody can do this. Uh, but really, you know, if they get somebody else in there, uh, maybe they wouldn't be able to, you know, raise the money, keep the uh, charity going, right? Keep NPR on the air. <laughs> so anyway, it is a good way. If you, if you want to get rich, you know, this is probably the one to uh, this and the uh, more targeted ads with, with Google and Facebook. But anyway, let's see what we have here. Uh, so even when customers do not respond with immediate purchases, uh, these messages can raise the company's brand awareness. So. You know what? <laughs> Example, <laughs> man, I have heard this uh, my pillow guy. I can't believe it. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Amazingly, <laughs> but you know, I must have seen his stupid ads about a hundred thousand times. I feel like you know, my pillow. I mean, it's kind of the point where I think I'd rather be uh, smothered with one of his pillows <laughs> to see this commercial uh, one more time. Uh, but it, it kind of has, you know, everybody knows about this my pillow. You know, I talked to my family from, you know, Louisiana. They know all about <laughs> those factories in Minnesota. <laughs> and so he's got great brand awareness. Uh, 
So even if you don't purchase the thing, you know, I guess maybe the idea is it gets implanted in your subconscious somehow. Uh, and you can think about the typical uh, my pillow ad. Definitely, that gains your attention in a freaky way. There's this is one ad where uh, the guy goes to the bathroom, and uh, the my pillow guy is like there in, in the bathroom looking through the mirror at him. <laughs> to me, this is like the stuff of nightmares. Uh, it definitely gains your attention though. Uh, then he generates interest, I guess, talking about all this uh, patented fill. See, I can, I can even remember some of the language from this ad. That's how sad this is. Uh, generates some ad. Bill's desire, you know, I guess he does that by saying, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the importance of sleep and money back. <laughs> and how, look how comfortable you'll be compared to this <laughs> idiot over here with the memory foam. I mean, look, look at this. Uh, look at this guy. You know, you, you should have the my pillow. <laughs> Uh, call to action, right? It's you know, usually the, they end with, uh, you know, call the number and uh, they'll throw in a free house, <laughs> to go with the, the free family <laughs> to go with the pillow. I'm, I'm being a little silly there, but you, you know, you get the idea. And we can learn from these ads, uh, even if it's not. I, I mean, I assume he's making lots of money with these, or they wouldn't be on all the time. Uh, effective sales messages contain a central sales theme. All right, so for that, my pillow one, you know, you could clearly see the theme there is uh, get a good night's sleep. <laughs> sleep is important. <laughs> All other pillows are, are might as well be concrete blocks <laughs> compared to my pillow. <laughs> it's not hard to pick out the theme. Anybody could pick that out instantly. Uh, and that's effective, right? Um, coherent, unified theme the consumers can recognize quickly. So as soon as I see, even if, even if that dude came out with a new ad, <laughs> You know, I probably wouldn't have to watch, but a second, as soon as I saw his face, I'd probably already know what it is he's going to say, <laughs> or at least the theme of it, you know, something to do with the comforting, uh, comfortable sleep. You know, he doesn't mix up the messages with all kinds of different themes. Now, let's see if we can get away from the my pillow guy. <laughs> I think he must, he must know his name's kind of hard to remember because I think he even refers to himself as that my pillow guy. I mean, I should get a kickback from the my pillow guy. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. A mass sales message with a strong logical uh, appeal. Uh, so this one's going for the logos, the logic, instead of emotion. Uh, so you can see, just again, just looking at the structure of it, I can see there's a table with some colored uh, cells on it. So that's, that's a good design there. Kind of gets your attention, right? Just even, even without looking at the text, just the sort of structure of the document uh, already kind of gets some uh, attention. They do have a nice subject line on this one. Car dealers can't beat better horizons on car loans. So that's what I like to see. I can just read the subject line alone, get a pretty good idea of what, what's going to be in there. Uh, desire, call to action. I notice they put some links in there you can click on instead of just uh, the phone number. Uh, <laughs> I have an asterisk there. <laughs> Terms are subject to your purchase situation and credit worthiness. Uh, so that's at the bottom. They got some bolding. I mean, good structure, good good content in that. Okay, uh, reviewing persuasive messages. So we're getting, <laughs> wrapping up. <laughs> so persuasive messages can potentially provide you with more professional opportunities, enhanced credibility, that'd be the positive, or <laughs> they can close off future opportunities and diminish your credibility. So do the following before sending a persuasive message. Yeah, get feedback. <laughs> A reread. I mean, I mean, imagine sending out some mass email uh, with a bunch of typos in it. You know, that would not <laughs> go over well. So I always say, anybody, get in, get somebody to look at this thing before you send it out. And your roommate, uh, spouse, friend, uh, you know, get the right place you can go to, but get some feedback on this thing. Uh, and then apply that uh, FAIR test. And we'll talk uh, more about that. <laughs> Here in a second. Uh, so how do you apply the fair test? Uh, how, how do you make it fair? Uh, manipulation, we need to talk about this first. Uh, so what you don't want to do is manipulate somebody. Uh, that's unethical. Uh, what is it? It's an attempt to influence others by some level of deception so you can achieve your own interest. So it's not necessarily lying outright. You can think about this as uh, 
you know, bending the facts or being selective with your information, uh, but somehow being unethical. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> this is the this is the acronym I have a hard time remembering. <laughs> I was hoping they'd put this in a table. <laughs> uh, so, are your persuasive messages fair? Uh, so, facts. How factual is the persuasive message? Have you presented all the facts correctly? Have you presented information that allows colleagues, customers, and consumers to make a good decision that is in their best interest? Have you considered various interpretations of the data? I mean, have you assessed the quality of your information? Uh, so a lot of times uh, uh, there'll be one little study that shows uh, maybe in that, that one study, I was just reading about one, you know, there's all these memory memory uh, apps uh, you can get on your phone. And some of these cost, you know, big money. These programs, they'll say, uh, hey, let your kid get these games, mind games for your kid. The kid will play them to improve uh, his or her working memory, raise their IQ. Well, there's a study, there might be a study <laughs> that sort of suggests that. Uh, but there's many more that show, no, it actually doesn't doesn't help. Or it's a lot more, uh, you know, the, the results are a lot more mixed uh, than that. So, you know, a very uh, deceptive ad or, or one that was unfair would just show you that one study, not talk about the ones that, uh, you know, suggest otherwise. Uh, so that's facts. Uh, access, how accessible or transparent are your motives? reasoning, information. <laughs> Do you have a hidden agenda? Are you not disclosing information that they should expect? You know, a lot of times uh, you see this come up in the context of reviews. Uh, so you'd be reading this review for a book or a restaurant and then find out later that that so-called reviewer uh, was a paid reviewer, <laughs> that the company paid <laughs> to write that review or that this person received a free copy or a free meal at the restaurant and returned for a review, you know, all that sort of thing. And I could tell you some horror stories about uh, the games industry, and they would just take these reviewers, you know, if you work for a magazine or even a website, we had a talk to a student one time right here at St. Cloud State, and uh, he and some friends had this gaming cheat site. So he had all these cheat codes uh, for games. That was kind of, <laughs> kind of the theme of the site. But uh, they'd also do these little reviews. Uh, but I guess he got enough traffic where he would get included on these. Uh, you know, when they were uh, when these big companies were releasing a, a big game, uh, he'd get, a, get an invitation to go on a cruise. <laughs> they would put these folks either a cruise or fly them out to some, uh, you know, fabulous resort somewhere and just, you know, wine and dine them. Uh, you know, give them all this free stuff, and then they go home and write a review of the new game. <laughs> you know, and guess why? Hmm, why is this game getting all these perfect scores? Yeah, <laughs> they didn't bother to tell you that. The reviewer didn't mention <laughs> uh, that they had wined and dined them. <clears throat> all right, impact. Uh, how does your communication impact uh, the stakeholders? Uh, so, yeah, if you really thought about this, it's a really good for the customers. You're trying to pull one over on them, et cetera. Uh, and then respect. How respectful is the communication? And sometimes, uh, as you can see with Dwight, <laughs> it's probably the poster uh, for being disrespectful. And you kind of wonder, does he realize it? Does he not care? Uh, who knows? But uh, sometimes you're not really sure. You're like, you know, I'm trying to be respectful here. I'm just not sure. What should I do? Uh, well, you could ask yourself, if you were the customer or the colleague, would you feel the tone of that was appropriate? Uh, you know, and some people would know, be able to answer that question, but I think a lot of people, well, okay, it seems appropriate to me. It seems fine to me, <laughs> but should you stop there? Uh, no, <laughs> especially if you're the type of person that gets complained about. Uh, if people are offended by you in the past. That just means uh, this is not a good test. We need to go on to uh, uh, the second and third one here. Let's see, does the message offend to pressure? Uh, I want to jump to this third one here. Uh, would a neutral observer consider your communication respectful? I think that's really the key. You know, so if you, you know, not you, not the customer, but just, you know, somebody that is sensible, <laughs> you know, have them look at it. Uh, do they think it's okay? You know, that could be a good 
just kind of a good way to uh, double check. All right, uh, covered a lot here. Uh, about an hour and a half's worth. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. We talked about the relationship between your credibility, your company's credibility and persuasion. Talked about some components of persuasive messages and how they those components are similar to but not identical to uh, the routine messages. Talked about appropriate tones and styles. And again, these will be different for external persuasive messages uh, than just routine internal communication uh, where you don't expect uh, resistance. Uh, we talked about internal external persuasive messages, uh, a little bit about mass sales messages. Uh, we talked about TV commercials, but really just anything that's going to go out uh, to a massive group. Uh, and then effective and fair persuasive messages. Uh, so even if you can get the sell, uh, but you have to do so by being manipulative, uh, you shouldn't do that. Because <laughs> uh, if you get caught, which you inevitably will, that will come back all the way back to the first one. And once you lose credibility, your ability to persuade will go down to, to nil. All right, so hopefully, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. If you have questions, comments, stories to share, anything along those lines, always love to hear it. Uh, so I'll stop here and hope you have a great day.